All right. Hello. Welcome. My name is um, Amy Miller, and I am the LRC director at Batavia High School. And today I'm going to talk to you about um, resources for high school libraries. These are things that have been really successful for me, and hopefully they will be for you. But, you know, I know that we're all in different situations. Um, when I first started as a librarian, there were uh, four of us working in the library, then there were three, then there were two, and now it's just me. So um, I do understand trying to, um, you know, do everything yourself and, and figuring that out. So hopefully I can help you um, with some of those things. All right. Um, I thought I'd start with talking a little bit about professional resources because I heard in the last session, connecting to others is just so important. That's where I really get my best ideas and my support. And when you feel like you are drowning, um, it's really nice to have those professional connections. Um, I know somebody in the last group talked about joining the IL listserv. Um, that is free to join. You don't need to even be a member of IELTS to join that. Um, not that I wouldn't recommend being a, a member of IELTS, but the listserv is amazing. Um, you can put any sort of question on there and you have hundreds of people from across the state um, answering your questions. Um, and what's nice, I think someone in the last session said something like, yeah, it can get overwhelming. You know what, I just look at the, the subject line and if it's not of interest to me, I just delete it. Um, I go through it once a day. But, um, you know, I've used it actually twice today alone. And so in my presentation, which Leah, my presentation is shared later, right? Yes. Everybody yeah, okay. will be able to access it later. Yes, there are links, you know, there are links to, um, to how to do that. But that's, that's just a really nice thing to be part of is that aisle, that aisle listserv. Because it's, it, again, some people will ask a topic, you know, there's this book and the elephant is blue and he has a red balloon. What is it? And someone will answer. So that is great. Another um, great resource that I heard someone else talk about as well is um, getting together with your public library. Um, I'm lucky I'm in a district that we have one public library. I know some of you are in districts that um, maybe a couple public libraries serve, but I've connected this presentation I'm not going to go through this whole thing, but these are all different things that I do with the public library that you can look at at a different time. But um, as far as books, instead of me, I used to do interlibrary loan myself um, and it got too overwhelming when I became the only person. So there is actually someone at the public library. I just email. They do the interlibrary loan for me. Um, and they, I actually have it delivered here to the high school from our high school picks it up. We are our delivery driver. So there are so many things that you can um, set up at the public library. I was just going to talk a little bit about um, some of the things with the public library that, let me see, that we do. Sorry about that. Let me back up here. Because the public library also has a lot more funding than you will have. So if you can share resources with the public library, for example, as far as databases, we were just talking about databases, so expensive. Um, you might wanna check which databases your public library has um, and make sure you're not purchasing those. And what my public library will do is I have a, like a dummy password that students can use, a username and password that um, if they're not, they don't have a card to that public library, they can still use the public library's databases. So you wanna make sure that you're sharing resources. Um, as far as like summer reading, in the, in the summer, I send all my summer reading books to the public library um, and then they're there for checkout and then I get them back. So we share, share books as well. Um, we also share programming. Um, sometimes I will um, host programs at the public library so I can get, um, more students involved. As I said, this is this is connected. We do a one book, one Batavia, which um, because I do that with the public library, they have a lot of money where they can usually get the author and some of those things. So again, great, um, great to share with them. I'm just looking to see if there was, as I said, you can go through this later. We have an inclusion game night for our special education students that I partner with the public library. Let's see what else I had on here. And also, I also have the public library and come and visit. We'll come and visit my book club. We'll do some database presentations and those types of things. And, and I have found anytime I've connected with the public library, they are so excited to do that because 
you know, they want the customers as well. So just some things to think about. You can go through that presentation at another time, but the, that, that connection to the public library is great. Another place you want to connect is social media. Um, you're, even if you're not if you're not big on social media, you're not posting a lot, I'm not a huge poster, but I follow tons of other high schools on um, Instagram and Twitter. And it's just fun to follow them. I can see their displays, I can see what they're doing and people are always so great. If you'll say, hey, I like that um, Hispanic Heritage Month display you did. Can you send me you know, the documents? I've never had someone um, say no. So just following other social media accounts um, is really great. Um, I especially find a lot of great stuff on Twitter. I linked my account here. Not that I'm, you know, doing things that are so fabulous, but I, again, just seeing what other people are doing, um, often gives me some ideas. Okay. So that would be another networking I would make. And another, uh, lastly, I would talk about networking on Facebook. There are some great, um, Facebook groups. One that I really like to follow is Future Ready Secondary Librarians. Um, I'll just scroll down here. Again, you know, just lots of ideas about things to do. People, people will post things that are going on in their library. People will post if they're having a problem. How would other people solve that? But I'm involved in probably like six or seven Facebook groups that I just look at occasionally and people share a lot of things there. So that would be how I would network, you know, through the listserv, my local public library, through social media, and through Facebook. Um, and also, if you know other librarians or people working in libraries, that's a great way to network as well. Okay, I'm nervous, so I'm probably going really fast. <laughs> and I'm working today, so I see kids, like, looking through the window. They're making me nervous. You're doing great. You're doing great. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Um, Along with professional organizations, again, I'm not sure how much money your library is giving you to spend, but I think some of these are, are really worth joining, again, because of the amount of information that you'll receive. Um, IELT, you can join the listserv without being a member of IELT, but if you are a member of IELT, there are all sorts of great resources with the award books and grants and scholarship and the newsletter and professional development. You know, that would be something I would definitely tell my administration. I think that this is important to join. Rails is free to join. And I can't tell you how many times I've reached out to Rails with just needing help with different things. And I've always gotten um, that assistance that I need. So that would definitely be a for sure. Now, the Illinois Library Association, the American Library Association, that's expensive. Um, I'm a member of those but I, I'm not sure if I didn't have the funds if I would do that just because it's very expensive. But what I do like is if I was having um, an issue with book banning or, or a big issue, I feel like I would want that support. But I do have to say, I probably look at the Rails stuff and the IELTS stuff a lot more than I do um, the ALA information. But that their website is amazing to go to. You don't have to be a member to access a lot of that information. And as far as if I had to purchase, ooh, I don't know why I wrote 13. It was more, there's a lot more than 13. It's, I think it's 135. If I was to purchase um, one place where to buy books from, I really love School Library Journal. Um, you can read it digitally. You can get the magazine. It has great articles about, you know, things to be doing in your library, but it also gives those book recommendations. So if you're someone who's kind of like, I don't, I don't know what to purchase, School Library Journal is a great resource. Um, and maybe there are other ones that people use, but that one is the one I have found to be the most helpful, especially for um, middle school and high school. They do have an elementary section as well, but I have found I really like those for middle school and high school. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about purchasing and grants. Um, and again, just to go back, if I'm going really fast, I have links on all of these things that you can click to that will give you further information. Um, probably like me, your money is limited. So you really have to think about, you know, what you're purchasing and where you're purchasing it from. 
Um, when purchasing books, this was a lesson I learned the hard way. You know, of course, we all think I'm just going to purchase all my books from Amazon um, because Amazon's super cheap and I can get it really quickly. But what you'll find is, you know, depending how those books are going to be used in your library and if they're going to be checked out a lot, um, you're going to really want to consider purchasing books with that library binding. Um, those tend to be, it tend to be more expensive. You can do that from Tidal Wave. You can do that from Permabound. Um, but that library binding can be really important, especially if it's like your year's award books and they're going to be going in and out of the library a lot. Um, you know, if it's Colleen Hoover or something like that, that you think maybe that, that trend will go away, definitely paperbacks from Amazon. But before you purchase, I would say just consider how the book is going to be used in the library um, rather than just going with the cheapest route because sometimes it doesn't end up being cheapest if you have to repurchase the book. Um, just so you know, if you are a Title I school, make sure that you sign up for First Book. First Book uh, um, is an amazing resource that has very inexpensive books. Um, for schools that are Title I. And if you're not sure if you're Title I, um, you can ask one of your administrators. And it's a very easy sign up to do that. Um, so that's deciding where to purchase. Deciding what to purchase. Um, this was another mistake I probably made right away when I became a librarian. I, um, I went through the, the collection and I, was, I got rid of a lot of things and I didn't understand the curriculum and how people were using our books quite yet. So I would not, if I was new to a library, I wouldn't start getting rid of stuff right away after until you've given it maybe a year to see how people are using books. Um, for example, um, we have students do a Harlem Renaissance project, which I didn't really know the curriculum that well, didn't know they were doing that project. We had tons of Harlem Renaissance books. I thought, well, we don't need all these. Um, and the teacher required every student have a book. Um, so now I understood better why we have that. So again, just a, just a tip not to start getting rid of things until you kind of see what's being used. And if you're, if you're trying to decide as far as fiction, what to buy, you know, look at those major award lists, look at the Lincoln Award, look at the Read for a Lifetime Award, look at the ALA Awards, I've linked those here. That's a great place to start if you're not quite sure what to buy, making sure you at least have those award books. Oh, let me go back here. Okay, my little box. Oh, I can, and deciding how to purchase. Again, find out how your school does purchasing do they give you a credit card? You have to do a PO. Make sure that you're purchasing tax exempt. Check to see that you're a Title I school. So things just to think about before you start purchasing books. Okay, I will move on here. Another thing I want to talk about is grant opportunities. Um, I, I My budget every year, I I apply for grants and 98% out of the time I get grants and it's not because I'm this fabulous grant writer. It's really that there are so many grants out there that and people want to give you money. Um, and I don't know how I would run my library without doing grants. That's really how I supplement um, my income. So one thing I, I would suggest to everyone is look for those local grant opportunities. That's where you're going to be probably the most successful and they're the easiest to obtain. Um, does your school district have a charitable foundation? Is there a PTO at your school? You know, a mother's club? Is there a local service club? All of those places often give grants. Um, and sometimes they're not huge. Sometimes it might be, you know, a couple hundred dollars here, a couple hundred dollars there, but that really can enhance your collection. Our state also has great grant opportunities that um, someone in the last session said, make sure you're on the aisle newsletter. Make sure you're on the Rails newsletter. There's actually a place in the Rails newsletter. I think both newsletters that talk about grants. The aisle grants are, are great. Um, there's a grant called that's coming up very soon, the Feed Your Need grant. You know, is there an area of the library that you would like to get some more books or materials for? The Rails grants are really good. The per capita grant, I'm not sure if someone's talked about that in another session, that's a, that's a no brainer. You just have to fill out the paperwork and you get the per capita grant from the state, but you just, you have to do it. Um, so that's something that you don't wanna miss are those, those, local, those local and state grant opportunities. Um, 
There are national grant opportunities as well. I have found those have been more difficult to get because obviously the pool is bigger. Um, I've been very successful with the Dollar General grant a couple times. So that might be something you wanna consider, but just keep your eyes open for those types of opportunities. Um, it's a really great way to enhance your collection. Um, another thing I want to talk about is book disposal, because um, there'll come a time when you'll have all these books that you're going to need to get rid of because they're not um, up to date, they're not credible maybe anymore, or they're just old and gross. And I know that can be difficult. Um, you know, what do I do with these books? So weeding eventually is going to be a really important part of your job because if, you know, the library doesn't look appealing when students come in and there's a bunch of stuff jammed in there, they're not going to want to check out books. So it's very important to weed your collection regularly. It creates room for more books. It makes it more visually appealing. There are tons of weeding guidelines online. I connected one here for you just to take a look at, but it tells you, you know, when should I weed? What section should I look at? How old should a book be? And so forth. And that has really helped me a lot as a librarian. Um, you know, I might be like, okay, this book hasn't been checked out in a year, but fiction, it might be five years or science, it's so many years. And that weeding guidelines um, I set forth for you um, or put on the page for you is, is super helpful. And don't try to tackle your whole library in one year. I would try to tackle maybe a section at a time because especially you don't want to weed everything and not, not have any monies um, to replace that. But I try to do um, I try to do some weeding every single year in the library and just try to pick different sections. Um, and as far as um, donating, I know people get very wound up about you can't throw books away. But you know if it's information, I always say if you wouldn't buy it or give it to a friend, that's not something that you want to donate. Um, just you know if you don't want an old yucky book other people don't want an old yucky book either. So if you are not donating, you know, what are some other things that you can do to get rid of books? Um, you know, I always, anything I'm weeding from the collection I put out for staff and students. Um, I have a free book section. Um, I can also donate some to the local, local public library. Scarce, if you are up in the, um, you know, uh, up in the suburbs of Chicago, Scarce is a great place where you can donate good books, um, books that um, you think people could use within their classroom. And I also sell books to Better World Books, and that's a very easy program to sign up for. Um, you do not make a whole lot of money, and it's probably not worth it unless you have a ton of books that you're getting rid of. Um, but that's something I do too, and there is some information there. As far as recycling, so when I get a bunch of books that I don't feel that anyone should have, meaning, again, not good information or they're dirty or, or whatnot, rather than throwing them in the garbage, we do, um, we do two things. We do some recycling. Um, we have a, a place here up by us called ACI Enterprises that will take our recycled books and then they'll pay us per pound. Again, not a ton of money, but they're making the books into new paper and new books. So that's something I feel good about. And I use a ton of old books for crafts and other things. We upcycle. Um, my book club, we always make book crafts. I make bookmarks out of books and laminate them and send them to the grade school. So we're using, the art department uses our books. We're really trying to use those in different ways. So again, something else to think about when you're trying to get rid of books in your collection. Um, the last thing I want to talk about is displays and programming, because I think that's important to keep your library somewhere that people want to come to and spend time. Let's look at my time here. I'm doing okay. Um, where do you get your ideas for displays and programming? Couple things I, couple places I have found that are really great. Um, the last couple of years, I have been using this Demco Library Planner. It's like a it's like a teacher planner, but for librarians, um, it is $34. But what I like about it so much is it gives you everything that's going on in the library world or the book world, you know, what's happening this month, what could be a good display this month. Here are some things to try. Um, it gives you tips each week. I've really enjoyed using it as a planning tool and it has given me book recommendations and that type of thing. So I've enjoyed that. Um, Another great resource 
um, at first book, there's, if you go to first book, there's a link called free resources. They have some great things, but they have this thing called the school year diversity and inclusion calendar that talks about all the different things going on um, within the world of diversity and inclusion that you could be celebrating in your library. And I have found that to be really helpful in giving me some ideas. Also on social media, I had said earlier, you wanna follow different people on social media. Here's what I call the best of the best on social media. I'm sure maybe when we have a discussion here in a moment, other people will have better ideas, but programming librarian interest group is a great one. Graphic design for library creators is a great one. People share their displays. On Instagram, here are three librarians that I think are, are great to follow that have some really good ideas. And oftentimes I'll just go to Pinterest and type in school library displays or school library for October and displays and ideas will, will come up there. So those are places that I definitely like to look. Um, and this part, though it's my last slide, I would probably say this has been the most important to me is, you know, how do I get assistance? I'm in the library alone. Um, and I, there were things that were very important to me that I did not want to give up being a librarian, a solo librarian. So I have en enlisted volunteers. I can't tell you how amazing my student volunteers have been. I have a huge crew of student volunteers. Um, I have a student actually running the library right now. And it, it has taken me a little bit to give up control, um, but, uh, and there will be mistakes and there will be books that go missing. But I, I will tell you, the students have really stepped up. We have a TA program here at our high school. So I actually can have a student TA, a teaching assistant in here with me um, most periods. But I also have students that come in after school. I have students that come in before school. I have students that come in when their work is done. Um, I, one thing I've learned though, is I have to give very clear instructions to students. Like I thought I showed them how to put books away, but then books are all in the wrong spot. So giving them really clear instructions, but students want to do my displays. Um, they want to put books away. They really like helping. Um, another really great place I found help is retired staff members um, that, that want to come back and help for a couple hours. So if there's someone that you like on your staff that's retiring, consider that. I also have staff members who may have a bit of time during the day. I have a teacher in here, third block. She just likes to sit in the library. And if I'm busy, you know, she's doing her work, but she'll help check out books. My 82-year-old uh, mother comes in and helps once a week. You know, retired family members, which sounds kind of crazy. I have to give her, there's certain jobs she's good at, other ones not so much. But, you know, she has been coming in once a week and helping parent volunteers. So... I guess what I want to say with that is, you know, I kept thinking my situation was going to change, that I'm not going to be alone in the library, and that never changed. So I had to kind of develop um, a crew of my own to help me. So it can be done. Um, it's often chaos and crazy, but um, getting people to help is, um, is ideal. I also put my, you know, my contact here at the bottom if you ever wanted to um, email me with any questions. I know that was a very quick conversation and you've, it sounds like some of you have probably been kind of thrown into a library situation, but hopefully some of those tips will help you. And I wanted to leave maybe um, five minutes and it looks like I, I did here at the end if anyone had any questions or anything they wanted to add, maybe things that they do. Um, or have places they have ordered or accounts that they have followed that have been um, beneficial. That's it. <laughs> There's a lot of things in the chat, so I'm going to go through some of these pretty okay. quickly. Yeah, I um, they're, okay. they're not questions exactly, but they're just like comments. Okay. So somebody said, yes, they're a Title I school. They love first book. Um, yes. at Melissa Corey is a favorite Twitter account to follow. She's in Missouri. Also boss librarian, um, school librarians United is one that I recommended. It's a okay. podcast and, um, they cover tons of topics. Let's see what else. If you have students with reading disabilities, look at learning ally bookshare and national library service for the blind. Um, Gwen and Deborah talked about the Illinois School Library grant and get, put the link out there in the chat for getting to that. 
Um, people are talking about blackout poetry with old books. That is a great idea. Yep, that's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Let's see. Many, many people who love the Demco planner. <laughs> Let's see. Do you have any issues with volunteers doing the work of a staff member that should be a union employee? Well, kind of interesting. Um, not so much that, but I do sometimes have students doing things, you know, when they're checking out books, you know, you can see students' records, you can see that information. And the way I've handled it, I have just, I've sat down and we've had a talk about what a library is and what privacy is and how important it is um, that they're, they're following that, that we would never comment on what someone's checking out or share that with other people. And I found that when I've had that conversation, students take that very seriously. Um, and, you know, they'll say, I would never do that. And I, you know, I say, if you're going to check out books, this is so important that you do that. We are so understaffed right now that I don't think we've had like a people doing a union issue job. Like we, um, we can't fill any of our para positions. So the library is the last on the list to get filled so um not in this track but one of the other tracks um there is a whole session about working with volunteers so um if you have time to go back and listen to that recording there will be a lot of uh guidelines for working with volunteers do we have any more questions We have um, we have a growing number of students from Turkey, Ukraine, and China. Any recommendations for foreign language books? You know what? Um, my public library has been very helpful with that. Um, when I have said we have a you know a student from this country, and I mean I know how to use um, to look that up, but they will look that up for me. So I would say connecting with your public library has been really helpful for me um, with that. That is a tough one finding those um, foreign language books. Spanish was always the easiest, but like right. you've got some really, so more agreement on ELL books. Let's see, anybody else? Any other questions? I don't see any. Thank you so much, Amy, for a great presentation. There's lots of accolades in the, in the chat for you. They appreciated your information oh, very, very oh, much. <laughs> And I, I see that. Where do you find text audio for Spanish? Oh, I just saw that. Yep. Um, I mean, I do Access 360 and I know when I order through Tidal Wave, through Follett, you can order books in Spanish. Um, I'm not sure where other people do that, but I get my Spanish audio through Tidal Wave. And I would assume those are grants apply to public schools, correct? All the rails and IL grants. Um, yeah. I, Gwen, are you still on? Can you uh, speak to that? I am not 100% sure. And I don't want to say if I'm not correct. If she's not there, I will look up and get back to you about that one. Usually it just says. It usually, libraries. I think maybe um, it's not, it's not for private schools, but I am not, I don't want to say one way or the other till I know for okay. sure. So I will, I will try to find that out and get back to you. Um, Okay. Or if you, I'm not sure who's asking. I don't know which Harris that is. But if you are a Rails person, you can ask Dan as well. He can double check that and let you know. 